I'm not trying to do theology in a way that's like nice and making everyone happy, you know? We, we need provocative um, voices in our theological and faith spaces. Okay. Okay. One, two, ready, go. Welcome to the Called to be Bad podcast. My name is Mariah Martin, and I feel called to be bad. It turns out I'm not the only one. Join us as we dig into all things bad, scandalous, deviant, you know, the stuff that makes good church folks squirm in the sanctuary. Why? Well, because sometimes the scandalous is spiritual, deviant is divine, and bad is beautiful. Say yes to the call and let's see what holy trouble we get into today. Hello, Annabeth. Hi, Mariah. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. So, um, everyone, this is Annabeth Rashley, um, and Annabeth works, exists, dreams at the intersections of individual and collective healing um, with a focus on trauma, grief, and loss, liberatory justice, and queer theology and spirituality. Annabeth will complete a Master of Divinity degree from Chicago Theological Seminary in May 2021, with an LGBTQ religious studies concentration on queer abolitionist theology. They are a recognized leader for queer and racial justice in Mennonite Church USA. Um, and so when Annabeth and I started talking about being on the podcast and I asked um, them what they'd like to talk about, Annabeth, Annabeth said queer abolitionist theology. And I was so intrigued, I'd never heard like pairing or not pairing what's the word for three things i've never heard those words linked together like that before and um i've only used them heard them used separately so i was very intrigued um so that's what we're going to talk about today and i'm super excited um but before we dive into that i'd love to hear annabeth what your drink is today uh, i'm drinking uh finishing coffee um and i knew you were going to ask me this so i chose one of my favorite uh, queer mugs, <laughs> fabulous, fierce, and sacred, um, was a gathering of queer Mennonite folk and some allies uh, in Chicago in the fall of 2014, I believe. Um, okay. And I drink out of this one a lot, but um, I did choose it today to invoke fabulous, fierce, and sacredness. Oh my God. I love it. Yeah. And it's a white mug and there's like, is that an eagle on it or some sort of? Um, it's, a, it's a bird kind of made up of uh, what to me seem like multicolored leaves. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, red, oranges, greens, yellows. Now that I look uh, at it, it like gives me, colors. it gives me like Phoenix energy. Like, yeah. Phoenix rising vibes for yeah. sure. <laughs> I love it. And I have, um, unfortunately, just the dregs of my coffee this morning. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a chance. I, I wasn't sure if I was ready for a second cup. I think I would be way too chatty if I had two, two cups of coffee. Um, and so I just have a coffee um, mm -hmm. bike mug and it says, where you go, I go, um, which I think is a reference to Ruth. Um, and yeah. So. Um, well, I'm also an avid cyclist um so maybe you subconsciously also picked it to invoke that spirit as well so. that's <laughs> um, awesome and love biking <laughs> yeah oh i love it hello beloved baddies a quick break to tell you that this episode is sponsored by the center for art humor and soul a nonprofit that supports and amplifies the voices of edgewalkers through art that catalyzes change laughter that brings us together and soul awakening to the creative spark within us. The support from the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul has meant the world to this podcast, so I highly encourage you to check out their website, arthumorandsoul.com, to see their other featured artists and projects. If you want to support the podcast, you can check out our Patreon or get in touch. Now I'll let you get back to this episode of Called to be Bad. As per usual, we're going to start with defining terms um, just so we can establish shared language for, for this podcast. Um, so yeah, Annabeth, I'd love to how you, I would love to hear how you use um, queer 
like each one define queer abolitionist and also theology? So, I mean, yes, this could be the whole podcast. <laughs> Fair. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so I think just to name at the offset, like queerness, abolition, theology, right? Like these are um, dynamic, multi-dimensional um, <laughs> terms that represent movements and ways of being and like deep, complex histories. And so, yeah, I think I, I want to dig into that with you and also like situate myself um, in this moment in time as a queer white person with settler colonial lineage and Anabaptist lineage and um, being geographically placed here near the Great Lakes right now. Um, and yeah, I, I think um, have, a, have just, yeah, recognize, want to recognize that I, that I come to this with like a certain, um, with certain perspectives and I'm excited to be in conversation around um, all of this also in ways that grapples um, with ways that people have done done work around all of these intersections, queerness, abolition, theology, um, past and present. So yeah, um, a big thing for me in um, learning about and studying and practicing uh, doing theology from a queer perspective has been building on the ways that queerness is a way of representing kinds of relationships, identity, sexuality. Uh, a pivot point for me was coming to recognize queerness also as an orientation to power. That framing is something for me that I, I locate uh, kind of learning or coming to understand um, through conversations with my friend um, and freedom fighter, Wendy Moore O'Neill. Um, but you know, queerness, queerness as a way of being oriented to, to power, to dominant power is, I mean, I think there's like lots of legacies there in ter um, that, that we could trace to, that I also trace to black feminist, uh, queer black feminist thought and practice. So long lineage there, <laughs> that's nothing new, but that is, a, that queerness as an orientation to power is, is a major piece of how I'm approaching this work right now. For me, that's also where kind of in this entanglement <laughs> of queer abolitionist theology, um, that that's a place where I really feel the alignment with abolition and uh, which is also has a long history in terms of um, being um, a movement and practice and strategy for uh, overturning slavery as an institution in the United States, and um, then in recent decades has has really been embraced um, as a framework and um, and set of strategies and practices for abolishing the prison industrial complex um, and policing systems of policing and has definitely gotten um, into the national conversation in this last year with the uprisings around um, the murder of George Floyd. And um, so it's, it's very timely and it also has, is also a, a term that represents like many movements that um, have, I think ultimately been grounded in um, black liberation and freedom struggle um, specifically in trying to be free from the ways that all of the ways that like white supremacy manifests in this country. Recognizing all of that, I some of the 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 people that I've been learning from and movements that I've been a part of over these last number of years are committed to um, PIC, prison industrial complex abolition, also as an orientation that is helping us think about 
how to eradicate the root causes of harm and while at the same time building up systems and practices and relationships that nourish. That kind of framing like clicked with <laughs> a lot of, you know, um, some of the best of like Mennonite and Anabaptist practice and teaching around transformative justice and restorative justice and how we deal um, with harm in ways that are not based in punishment and specifically based in carceral responses to punishment. I want to be really cautious that, you know, especially as a queer white person involved in these movements, that abolition is, I'm not appropriating abolition. I think that's really important for any white folks to be mindful of. And I also want to be invitational in situating it in, a, in its historical context, in a long-term vision to be living in a world uh, liberated from the prison industrial complex, from systems of policing. And there's so many ways that we can practice abolition and abolitionist mindsets that are about like helping meet each other's needs. It, there's, there's creativity and there's spirituality in there and there's connecting with ancestors and elders like it we like it is such a dynamic framework that yeah I think is an invitation to a kind of spirit and a kind of vision it, just as it is also like concrete ways of organizing and practice and strategy right so so for me it's it's this multi-dimensionality is um, both really tangible and it's also very visionary and is kind of like queerness as an orientation to power. There's a way that I feel like abolition is, a, is an orientation to, <laughs> I don't know, liberation or <laughs> certainly to, um, to more liberated ways of being in relationship to harm. Then the theology piece for me is like, as someone doing theology, I consider myself a theologian and more broadly, I think for people who are trying to do justice work from a faith perspective, a, a queer abolitionist theology is certainly interested in building the liberated world, right? That I'm, that I'm putting out here. It, and for me, a really key piece of that is kind of interrogating the ways that Christianity has had a history of coloniality and the ways that Christianity has been a vessel for maintaining white supremacy and cis heteropatriarchy and the kinds of ideologies that uh, get, get masked as religiosity, right? But are really sort of some of the fundamental building blocks in like maintaining domination and control which is at the heart of a carceral society. So for me, the, the theological connection is, is almost like turning this framework in, internally on theology itself and saying what needs to be excavated here, where are the roots of <laughs> carcerality in our beliefs? What makes us believe that there are some people <laughs> so ungodly, unworthy, you fill in the blank that, that that people deserve to be caged. <laughs> right. Um, and then how do we shift and transform and unearth into to, to more liberated approaches to theology? I, I think I just reached a point where I felt like, is this going far enough? If like we still, we have a, a massively growing <laughs> prison population and systems of prison and we're giving more money to the police. And um, I think sometimes liberation theology that ends up being more about ministering to people in prison or in, you know, there's, there's so much good ministry out there around like helping people who are um, coming out of prison. And um, again, all, all of, like all of this is, is good. My question is at the end of the day, do we still have <laughs> beliefs about the divine, about God, about humans somewhere in there that are getting away of actually like a whole new way of being in the world that does not rely on the carceral system? And so I've been really interested in queerness, abolition, <laughs> queer abolitionist theology 
as a pathway to try to be doing a lot of theological reimagining and and reimagining and also th this yes i think we need to be imagining whole new ways of being but some of those new new ways are reclamations of like mm -hmm. ancient wisdom indigenous wisdom um etc so new is also reclaim a reclamation in a lot of cases yeah i like that i like the idea that um some new ideas are actually very old ideas that that we have applied to new settings really and we can't really claim it as new um but uh, as you were talking, um, I was thinking about how much of our Christian language uh, revolves around some sort of um, dualism or, or binary, mm -hmm. good or bad. I mean, that's the heart of this podcast is talking about mm -hmm. examining good and bad, holy, um, profane, sinner, saintly. And, you know, if we actually apply these labels to people, you are a sinner, um, that feeds right into this um, prison industrial complex of, of, of labeling people That's as criminals or bad or deserving punishment, um, sinful. Um, and perhaps I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but um, part of your queering this is, is breaking out of this, this binary and these dualisms, is, is that right? Uh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna go into that? Or do you yeah. wanna first talk about kind of like the work that you've done and how it's informed your um, theology. Um, no, I mean, you're bringing up the binaries. I think that that, yeah, that's a huge piece of, um, again, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't claim that, you know, queer theory or queer theology is the only <laughs> way that we, um, that we disrupt these mm -hmm. oppressive binaries, but for me, it has been like a, a major um, way to understand and try to move beyond um, these binary constructs, which, you know, queer theory would say are ultimately constructed. <laughs> like mm -hmm. there, yeah. there's that, you know, that there's not actually a hard and fast rigid line between um, these categories of certainly social categories like white and black or man and woman, um, human and animal, right. yeah. uh, sometimes colonizer and colonized, right? Like the, these social categories, which we must pause and acknowledge that even, even though they are at the end of the day constructed and in some ways false, quote unquote, they impacts of these binary categories are absolutely real, material, um, profoundly, profoundly make life more livable for some. Yeah. <laughs> some Judith Butler in there. Um, and profoundly not livable or much less livable for others. So, you know, we have to do this, um, the, 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 the holding of that of those dual or multiple realities and tensions, I think, in mm -hmm. in trying to say, like, at the end of the day, <laughs> um, this rigid line is is not so rigid. And so, queering, queer, queer as a verb, queering to to queer um, these binary categories is to 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 first say, hey, these aren't as fixed mm -hmm. as we sometimes like to think that they are, and um, and let's disrupt, let's trouble, let's problematize <laughs> that in a way that is ultimately, I think, has a lot of really liberative potential. Um, so you're absolutely right. Like for me, queerness has been a way to connect with abolition um, because I see how these binary categories undergird exactly what you were just saying, that the way they, they inform and shape our beliefs that like some people are deserving <laughs> of punishment and others are not and or or even this the category of guilt and innocence right, right? like 
in the so-called criminal justice system, <laughs> those end up being extremely arbitrary categories. Again, I mean, I think one of the um, shorthand <laughs> responses for why abolition <laughs> is like, well, it, are, are prisons working? <laughs> right, are policing yeah. working? Like have all of the terrible things in this world stopped happening? And yet prison, the prison industrial complex is, is growing, right? So some of the people that perpetuate massive amounts of harm are not incarcerated, et cetera. Like we, we need to be, I think, shifting away from guilt and innocence and into more of like, how do we hold instances of harm? How do we think and dream into, you know, ways of organizing ourselves as a society where there are fewer instances of harm because more people are getting more of their needs met, you know, that's what takes us into <laughs> mutual aid and um, all kinds of practices that have us um, shifting economics and resources, et cetera. This is another, I think, gift of, of queer perspective, but just the capacity to like hold more nuance. We need to be better equipped to deal with the fact that like we are all capable of, of doing harm and certainly of experiencing harm and that, that, that those are not, again, those are not like fixed categories. And um, we certainly need societal practices um, that can hold that and and I mean I think we're having this conversation because <laughs> I think we need theologies that can um, help us get past some of those binaries as well. Yeah. Marcella Alphonse, Marcella Alphonse Reed has been um, hugely influential I think in helping me make these theological connections. Mm -hmm. um, her work centers so much on well, her book, Indecent Theology. <laughs> yeah, her way of exposing these categories of decency and indecency and morality and immorality and um, worthiness, unworthiness, uh, which, yeah, I think, I think those things play out, these, these binary categories play out all the time in theological discourse, in, um, in faith context, et cetera, e even when it's not happening like overtly or on the surface. And these are also categories that change over time, <laughs> you know, which, which I mean, ch change is okay. But like, again, you know, what, um, what would have been considered indecent 50 years ago is like not the same thing. And so again, it's just, I think we have to be like much more <laughs> minimally transparent and realistic about um, the, these are like socially <laughs> constructed. This, this doesn't mean that we don't bring, you know, an ethic, uh, like a set of ethics, right? Um, but, you know, I want, when I'm making decisions or, um, yeah, shaping, helping shape faith practices or figuring out what to do in a harmful situation, like I want my ethics to be grounded in I don't know, values like <laughs> respect and dignity and safety and consent, right? Like not just some uh, kind of socially conceived idea of what's decent, right? So anyways, Marcella Althaus Reed like blows the lid off of like <laughs> decency in Christian theology. And she was holding Latin American liberation theology to account to say like liberation theologies have been part of resisting that colonial legacy, particularly when it comes to capitalism and economics. But what about the body? And what about the queer body? And what about the queer indecent body? <laughs> All of the ways that our bodies are these messy, confusing, disruptive, <laughs> like, like if we're honest, our bodies don't fit neatly into categories and desire doesn't fit neatly into categories. So yeah, she, Alpha Street has, has, has been one of my biggest, um, I think queer theological inspirations it, because she, her, um, the way she's engaging queerness and indecency and, and cracking open these oppressive binaries is 
is a de a decolonial project. I mean, Mar Marcel Althaus Reed always would talk about co controlling bodies in love and lovers of bodies. Another way to get at these questions is how, how have theologies been used to control bodies in love and lovers of bodies? And so if I was to distill all of, you know, I think queer theology and even queer abolitionist theology kind of distilled would be about queering love and queering power. Control and domination <laughs> rely on, con on essentially controlling and having power over bodies and concepts yeah. of love. Um, yeah, that, um, and I'm sure I'm not the first to make this connection, um, but it reminds me of the story of the woman caught in adultery. Talk about like domination over bodies and lovers mm -hmm. of bodies. Um, these group of men um, take this this woman who was supposedly caught in the act of adultery and bring her naked before Jesus. And Jesus almost queers the ideas of, of, of guilty and innocent when he says, okay, mm -hmm. um, he who is without sin should cast the first stone. Kind of implying, you know, you are all have made mistakes. You've all made choices that have had consequences. And yeah, anyways, I was just like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Woman con adultery, bodies, you know, trying to control bodies and mm -hmm. breaking down the binary of who is guilty and innocent and sinful and pure and all of that. Yeah, I love, I love lifting that. That's, I'm not sure I had um, thought about that story in particular as an instance of, of Jesus queering a binary. I really, yeah, I appreciate that. Maybe there's, there's something there. I'm sure someone else has written on, on it already, but um yeah oh my goodness there's so much there uh i want to yeah. hear about um you've done some work in different um areas that have uh kind of had some um real lived experience that informs your ideas of queer abolition mm -hmm. theology um you worked with the chicago torture justice center um working in harm reduction and community resilience work um in washington dc um, yeah, do you want to talk about some of those roles um, and how that informed your work? Yeah, I think it's really important to, I mean, we just, we just spent a, a while here, um, like nerding out on yeah. uh, theory and theology, which I love and can do all day. And it's um, very necessary to <laughs> ground this in um, how, what this means in our real lived experience and um, yeah, this very much um, for me, I mean, uh, d doing a Master of Divinity and deciding to focus on um, queer study, queer religious studies and abolition theology, etc. Um, really, for me, was a decision that um, came out of, of about a decade of um, work in various contexts, but um, yeah, I, grounded in liberative social movements and for a number of years was uh, really focused on um, supporting survivors of sexual and intimate partner violence um, who were also experiencing housing insecurity as a result of trauma and um, yeah I was, I was very shaped by being a part of those kind of intersecting movements in Washington, D.C., and um, that organization took a harm reduction approach, which um, harm reduction, you know, uh, historically was needle exchange programs and working with people who were using drugs as a, as a framework to try to reduce harm and increase safety um, in those situations. And those principles continue to be applied in a number of contexts, and so that was a, a way that fundamentally um, we were thinking about what it means to um, be on healing journeys and recovering post abusive experiences, but also sometimes in contexts where like those relationships continue and um, how do we support survivors in healing that is survivor centered and is about reclaiming um, one's own agency and decision making power. The, the other community that you mentioned that I've been working alongside it here in Chicago, um, also a very survivor centered organization 
um, the Chicago Torture Justice Center, which came out of a movement for reparations here in Chicago for survivors of police torture. So there's a tragic and long history here in Chicago of systematic torture um, by the Chicago police um, that resulted in over 800, but um, probably many, many more known cases of torture that resulted in very long prison sentences for people who were essentially tortured into confession. The 2015 reparations ordinance, um, which was definitely a amazing win um, here in this city, and I think is a really powerful example of um, ways that reparations can be realized, mm -hmm. even as it's not perfect, and even as, you know, a, a formal recognition of these historic wrongs, like, doesn't automatically mean that there aren't ways that torture and trauma continue. I mean, they absolutely do. The, the, the police have shot and killed at least three people in the in just in the last like month or so here. And those are just the ones that like have kind of made it to, to public recognition in Chicago. So the the Chicago Torture Justice Center was like one piece of this the city um, issuing reparations to survive to um, predominantly African American men who have um, been survivors of of torture, you know. So, so I was at the at the center. I was very, very honored to get to do some work there as part of my MDiv degree, and was kind of serving there as a queer theologian chaplain, um, and did a lot of work around grief, politicized grief in this model of politicized healing. And I mean, I. I have just learned like so much from survivors and from the community surrounding the center at the center. Um, one of the pieces that I've really reflected on so much, and that was a big, my, my thesis essentially was like using this queer abolitionist theology framework, kind of using that as a lens to really like dig deep and think about the healing work of the center again. So just to kind of bring it back to like a, <laughs> an embodied experience. Yeah, I think particularly in um, contexts and communities and in bodies that have, that hold so many layers of trauma and all of the ways that that, that trauma is um, trauma upon trauma upon trauma in a deeply like, white supremacist carceral <laughs> state. Healing is both like something that can be so tangible and real. <laughs> it is it is everything from like the win of a reparations ordinance or like the concrete ways that mothers of survivors hold space and bless one another and are a salvific force for one another in fighting for their children who are incarcerated, right? Like this, it's like that's healing. It's tangible. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> there is something that is always still unfolding or being revealed and um, that is like the healing yet to come. And for me, that's for me as a theological and spiritually oriented person, like that, that feels very much like a way that I experience God, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this like as a sacred unfolding and becoming and as a as a divine presence that is always continually being incarnated, being embodied, like that that is never quite done and that the wholeness and fullness of our visions for liberation and our longings and our desires for a much more just and well world, <laughs> both are happening in these, they, they feel like abolitionist inbreakings to me, <laughs> like they're happening and they're also like never, it's, it's healing that is, has not been yet like fully realized. Mm. Um, Reminds me of like the now, but not yet. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why it feels theologically like a eschatological <laughs> yeah. abolition as an eschatological piece, but yet not something that's, it, it's not, it's queer eschatology because it's not, um, 
it's not only located in the future. It is like a way of being oriented to time and space that's extremely liminal. <laughs> it's here and not yet here, right? It's betwixt and between. <laughs> uh, yeah, do you want to say more about um, this idea of abolition as an eschatological vision? Um, what is your vision for the way queer abolitionist theology can impact churches, communities, mm. justice, justice prison systems? Yeah, yeah. I, I really, I hope queer abolitionist theology can be an invitation. Again, like not, I, I do think there are bold ways that we need to reckon um, and deal with how dominant Christianity and even sometimes like progressive justice Christianity is still caught up in empire, right? Like we need to be more discerning and more bold in excavating and unearthing ways that that happens. Um, but like I was saying, you know, I don't, I, this vision of a radical transformation of a of transformation that happens on the root level, <laughs> this abolitionist like tearing down, building up is not all brand new, right? Like there is this piece of ancient wisdom and learning histories that aren't just the white European version of history that, that we've been that many of us have been kind of conditioned into. So yeah, I think there's this kind of digging deep, digging back. And I, I see queer abolitionist theology as one way to be kind of naming how we're doing that mm -hmm. in this moment. And there's so much in theology that is an invitation to dreaming and an invitation to wild... <laughs> imagination and vision. And this is from one of my favorite books, Captive Genders, but um, speaking that which we do not yet even have the words to wish for. Mm -hmm. Like there's this, there's a kind of like vulnerability and risk, which, which is deeply part of an abolitionist posture, I think. Like being willing to, to try something on, to collectively like be trying to build something or be on a pathway towards something because we know that like we can't keep we cannot keep doing it the way that it's been done we cannot keep responding to harm like by locking people up and surveilling one another right so queer eschatology is a <laughs> is an invitation to be leaning into that to the the past and present wisdom that helps us speak into being like that which we cannot yet fully know is, is that not the sacred path is that not like the what it means to to hold not just what we know to be true about god but the sacred unfolding of of divine mystery is 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 ultimately a faithful path into the unknown into the unknown <laughs> um couldn't help but get some frozen too in there. Um, <laughs> I thought that was a frozen reference, but yeah, that was a frozen <laughs> not knowing the entire canon. I... <laughs> it's a good movie. It's a surprisingly good movie, I think. Um, but yeah, oh, I, I love that. That that feels very um, hopeful to me. I, I'm I'm inspired by that. Wild dreaming is as you named it. Um, yeah, would it be okay if I end us with a blessing for you and all the viewers and listeners? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's one more thing I would love to say. Um, okay. It's like an honor to be considered a bad pastor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, how would you respond if someone said that you were a bad, you know, whatever, Christian Mennonite pastor uh, for, for doing yeah. that? I'd be like, thank you. You you get me. <laughs> you get me. You this, understand. This I'm not trying to do theology in a way that's like nice and making everyone happy. You know, we we need provocative um, voices in our theological and faith spaces, and um, so yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a delight to be considered a bad pastor. <laughs> I love it. Great. Um, well, on that note, um, Annabeth and all you viewers and listeners, um, may you leave this space um, with the spirit of wild dreaming that we talked about today, um, with this eschatological vision um, for um, both harm reduction and also radical healing. 
um, in yourself and others. Um, and when you go find um, these voices of profound hope and um, agitation in the mm -hmm. best sense of the word. Amen. Go in not, well, peace, but also... <laughs> What's provocative that? peace. Provocative <laughs> peace. Go in provocative peace. Yes. Indecent peace. Yes. <laughs> gonna... I was, I was yeah. looking for a Marcella word. In, in, as I say, in the words of Saint Marcella. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you for that blessing. Thank yeah. You that. Thanks for being on and um, sharing from your incredible brain and the work that you've been doing. That's all for this episode of Called to be Bad. Keep being your bad, beautiful selves, and I will see you next time.